Well, it's Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. It's exciting to be here. It's yeah. exciting to be in a place where God can speak to us and where God can move in us. Amen? Yeah. And uh, if you turn with me to, um, we're going to open up with this passage. Uh, turn me over to Luke chapter 24. Um, years ago, when I was in Bible college, um, we were being get, in a homiletics class. The first message that we had to teach on was um, out of, um, I think it was 1 Thessalonians 5, something like that. And the, the, the instructor was assigning us scripture. Well, that morning in the cafeteria, the uh, Lord just spoke to my heart. He said, I want you to preach this verse. And it was, it, was, it was the very last verse of that chapter. It said, nothing more than, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And as I raised my hand up and said, can I just preach that one verse? And the professor first looked at me and said, have you preached that before? I said, no, <laughs> I haven't. And I'm thinking, what did God just get me into? Okay. And as soon as I committed to doing it, he started just rolling in me these things. And I got in the car that day. I had drive back and forth. I was in the 90s, um, early 90s. And so Paul Harvey was still alive. So the rest of the story was still on the air at the time. And God says, this is how I want you to present that message about grace. And I haven't preached that in a while. Maybe somewhere down the road I'll get that back out and preach it. Because it's a good message on grace. But uh, so I did it and everything. Well, the other day, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, as I was meditating on where I was supposed to go with this message this morning, God dropped another thing in on me just like that, similar to that. I'm not sure... Uh, where or why the thought came to me because I hadn't read Dickens in a long time. I hadn't watched the movie in a long time. But he dropped it on me. So today, um, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and Charles Dickens, I have an Easter message for you, okay? But it's going to be different than you've ever heard before, I think. And I think that was the reason why he did, took me this way because I wanted it to be something different. I wanted it to be um, uh, dif uh, different than what I've ever done before, I think. And Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 3 says this, But the first day of the week, at uh, early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they had went, went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was dead. Let there be no doubt about it, he was dead. There was documentation of his death. There were witnesses at the, at the cross, at the crucifixion. There was the cross, the bloody cross. There was the tomb that he had been placed in. There was the stone that had been rolled in front of it. There was the guards that had been placed in front of the stone. And Pilate had signed the death certificate. Jesus was dead. In all accounts, he was dead, dead, dead. I can actually see the Pharisees back at their, at their house, just gathered around, slapping each other on the back. So, oh, man, we got him. We finally got that rabble rouser. We don't have to worry about upstart, that upstart carpenter anymore. We got him. He's done. And next week, we're going to run the rest of them out of town, too. Then there was, uh, and that was all being done while in their ears. They heard the words Jesus from the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know, what, know not what they do. As that rang in there, as they still were drinking and enjoying their party because they had gotten rid of Jesus. Meanwhile, back at Pilate's house, Pilate's sitting back. He's kicked back with his buddies too. And he's saying, well, that stuff, that fiasco's finally over. Finally got rid of that problem. And then next week, we're going to make it, to, take it to our advantage. Because we're going to go back into those guys, religious fools and we're going to get them to do things for us that they didn't do, want to do before. See, that's the way politics works. I do something for you, you've got to do something for me. And that's exactly what was going to happen then. And then there was Peter's house. Another gathering, three simple gatherings. In Peter's house, the disciples were grieving. They sat nearly motionless in disbelief. They questioned within themselves how could such a thing have happened? I mean, he had escaped so many other things. How could such a thing like this had happened? Last week, there was just this great crowd of cheering and chanting as he rode in. How could this have happened? It was the Sabbath. So they were required to rest, as all Jews were required to rest. 
But there was no rest in them. No one slept. No, each wept in their own time and sometimes loudly, sometimes just inside themselves, sitting by themselves. They at all times watched the door. All of them from time to time would watch the door expecting Jesus to walk through at any moment like he'd done many other times. Expecting him to be there. They watched to see uh, as it seemed like a bad dream had come upon them. And they were all having that same dream together. The facts were, according to the facts, Jesus was dead. His lifeless body was taken off the cross. Joseph Arimathea had led them carrying the body of, of their friend, their teacher, their master, their Lord to the tomb. Jesus' lifeless body was wrapped in barrel cloths. Jesus was dead. A stone had been placed in front of the tomb as they turned to get one last glance. They just looked over the church one last time to see the body of their friend as they rolled the stone in front of it. And the guards took their places in front of that tomb. Facts. All facts. According to the facts, Jesus was dead, dead, dead. Dead as dead could be. Jesus was dead, according to the facts. But then there's the truth. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. In this passage here, we just look at the first seven verses. We know what the end is. It's of the Great Commission. But in this first part of this, of this chapter in Matthew, it says this, And now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and, Mary, and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone uh, from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards uh, shook to, uh, for fear of him and became like dead men. They collapsed. Over, and when the, when the, the power of the light of heaven shines on those that don't know heaven and don't know God, they fall like dead men, just like that. And that's the way it's going to happen again. They're gonna, people are going to crumple to the knees. Every knee, the word says every knee will bow. These men were a men of authority, really. They weren't just peons. They were men that, that, that Pilate trusted. These were highly regarded guards. These were people where they were handpicked and said, these guys here will take care of this stone. No one will get through them. But when the angel of the Lord appeared on the stone and it rolled away, they collapsed as if they were dead. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he's risen. As he said, come see the place where, you, where, where the Lord lay and quickly and, and, and go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead and indeed he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now turn over to Mark chapter 16. In each one of these accounts, we're going to read a similar thing, but each one has its own view of what happened. Mark chapter 16, verses 4 through 7 says this. For when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was, it, was a very large it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, where, and they were alarmed. Verse 6 says, But he said to them, But do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said you would. So they went quickly and fled from the tomb, and they were uh, trembling and, and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now turn over to Luke chapter 24. Each one of these accounts telling that the fact, Jesus was dead. The fact was he laid in that tomb. The fact was he was wrapped in miracles. That was the facts. Chapter 24 of Luke says this. And we're going to look at verses um, I don't want to go all the way 1 through 12. Um, on now in the first start, reverse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them 
came to the tomb bringing the spices that they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And then they went, out, they went in and did, the, and did fi- not find the body of Jesus. And it happened as they went, were greatly perplexed about this, that, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, then as they were afraid and bowed their heads to the earth, they said to them, why do you not, why do you seek the living among the dead? The fact was Jesus was dead. The last time they saw him, the fact was they had laid that lifeless body on that uh, stone on, in, inside that tomb and wrapped it in burial clothes. The fact was he was dead. And they said, why are you searching for the living among the dead? And verse 6 says that he's not here, but risen. Remember how he spoke to you and he was, that he, when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. We're in the third day today. We celebrate the third day today. We don't celebrate his death and burial. We celebrate his resurrection. This is the third day and we live in the third day. Turn with me now over to Luke chapter uh, 23. So just back up a little bit, right? Uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 39 uh, through 43. It says, And then one of the criminals who were um, hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the, but the other one and the other answering rebuked him, saying, Did you not, Do you not fear the God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And when we... And when we indeed justly, we indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds. And I was saying, look, we're getting punished for what we've done. This guy here, he's done nothing. He's done nothing, but we're getting punished. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you today that you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was dying. The criminals were dying. The fact is, this man hanging next to Jesus was a criminal. The fact, that fact doesn't change. He died a criminal. But today's facts can make yesterday's facts irrelevant. Negate them. Give you an example. Guinness Book of World Records. Hank goes, eats 250 hot dogs in 30 minutes. And a month or two later, Rob goes... And eats 250 hot dogs in 25 minutes. The fact that Hank was the Guinness World Book of Records in 30 minutes of eating 250 hot dogs negated was irrelevant anymore. It was a fact. It's still a fact. It still exists. It's still in the record books. But he's not the record holder anymore. Now he's got to go back and beat Rob. (laughs) Yesterday's facts are still there. They're still existent. But other facts of today change and make them irrelevant it's like this fact is cubs won the world series two years ago (laughs) but it does not negate the fact that they didn't win it for 108 years (laughs) (laughs) fact fact is on on uh, september 8th of 1972 i was a a single man you almost thought i was going to say happily single didn't you (laughs) i know better than that she may be uh, uh, laid up right now, but she will have two good knees real soon. Um, fact on, the fact is, on uh, September 9th, 1972, I was a married man. Fact, on May 4th, 1979, I was lost and headed, not headed towards heaven. But on May 5th, 1979, Jesus came into my life in, in a real way and changed that fact that was the day before. Fact. On the day that Jesus was being crucified, two criminals were also being crucified. One criminal mocked and cursed him. The other one said, Jesus, today, will you remember me? The other one said to Jesus, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom today. And Jesus responded and said, today you will be with me in paradise. There are many say today that they're living a life, there are many living a life of peril. They're living outside the kingdom. They're living outside the word of God. They're not walking with Jesus. They're not, they're not, they're not even choosing to. They're rolling every, every day they're rolling the dice. Thinking, hoping that, and I'm hoping for them also that, you know, that I believe that Jesus gives everybody a chance up to the last breath. He gave the criminal a chance up to his last breath. There's my precedent for that. 
that it takes just that one last moment that Jesus still can enter in, but the seeds have to be planted for them to prosper, for them to mature. That's our job. We'll get to that in a minute. They're hoping that we're wrong. They're hoping that you and I are wrong. The ones that are out there claiming to be atheists, they're hoping that you and I are just a bunch of fools. And guess what? If we are, we're not. But if we are, we've not hurt. I've not hurt my life by living how I live, living for who I live for, and I'll do, I would do it all over again. But I'm not rolling the dice. They're choosing to stand outside the shadow of the cross when we're choosing to stand inside the shadow of the cross. Facts are facts. But when the truth come in, comes in, facts of your life change. Fact, I was once lost. Fact, I'm now found. Fact, I was once blind. Fact, I now see. Fact, I was once dead, but now, fact, I'm alive. Facts change because we change. Every day we change. What was fact in my life yesterday is no longer fact today. What was fact in Debbie's life a week ago where she had a bad knee is no longer fact today. It was facts then. The fact that the thief on the cross was a criminal and sentenced to death didn't change. He was on the cross. He had been sentenced to death. And by all the onlookers around, he was a thief. But the fact of his eternal destination changed just by a few simple words. Will you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? He was nailed to the cross. The fact that he, and fact was, he was a sinner. But just a few words, he was redeemed and headed towards paradise. Just in a few words. That changed the facts before. A prior fact was made irrelevant by a change in his condition. Well, I got through this quick. I didn't mean to get through this quick. So I hang out a little bit. On this one last point. This will be the fastest sermon you've ever heard me preach. Why? Because there's really just telling you facts. You know, when I, Easter to me as a child, and this is nothing uh, disparaging towards my parents or how we were raised, we just were just who we were, just like a lot of other people. But Easter as a child was that one time a year that we would go to church usually. I think there's probably more, but the ones that always stick in my mind are Palm Sunday and Easter. They're the ones that stick. And I remember those days that, that how, how it different it made me feel by being part of something like that, by being part of that church. I, I didn't know much about Jesus growing up, and when I decided to start listening to the, in my, that inner voice in me, calling me and beckoning me towards him, um, things started changing my life. I mean, uh, you just ask anybody. I've always been a good guy. Always been a great guy. You know, you just ask anybody. Uh, you know, <laughs> just ask Jim. He's one of my oldest friends. You just ask him back there. Oh yeah, yeah. Bob was always a great guy, <laughs> right? Um, he knew me back when before <laughs> transition. The thing is, beloved, is that when Jesus is made alive in our lives, facts change in our lives. And when facts change in our lives, that who we were is no longer us anymore. When I see people that know me from way back then, and they know me from the early days of just getting out of the army, if I ran into any of my army buddies, they would go, Bob Martin, a preacher? Oh, I can top that off. I do counseling. I can top that off. I got all this education. They thought I was a dumb white boy from central Illinois, you know? Thing is, is that facts changed. Now, I've said white, but the facts change. So we saw, we saw <laughs> I wanted to clear that before you got, before you got worried. Uh, it's, 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 it's like we watched a movie the other night. And someone said, just wanted to let you know, oh, it's, it was a crazy, stupid movie. Of course, the Adam Sandler movie, so you know it's crazy. Ridiculous Six is the name of it. It's a funny movie. It's a fun movie. And the one guy was, there were all these brothers, and the one guy says, I just want you to know my, my, my mama um, we all have the same father was this white guy and he said but my mama was no, I'm black also I've got some black in me I just want to make sure you knew and this guy was he was he was dark black <laughs> He's like, oh we didn't notice you know like <laughs> okay anyway how really that meant I mean <laughs> but the thing is is when Jesus comes in things change facts change all kinds it's like it's like on opening day 
the facts have so changed in Cub fans that on opening day, they thought a lot of them was like, it's like winning the World Series all over again. Now there's hope again. They know it's because, see, the curse in their mind that was prevalent in Cubs fans is over. It's gone. They broke it two years ago. So every time they win, it's the World Series victory. And when the Cardinals win this year, when they win the game, <laughs> the, the, the key is, is that, is that what you watch because see, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really picking on the Cub fans too much. I'm not really meaning to do that. I'm, what I'm saying is the mindset changed. The fact that they won the World Series two years, it changed the whole mindset. That's what happens when Christ comes into our life. You know, is it changes the mindset. It changes where we're going. That's what happened to the thief on the cross. Jesus was dying right next to him. But there was a, the, the thief on the cross uh, looked at him, saw him, and, and, and as he viewed him, there was an epiphany that happened in him. And he said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me, please. He's saying, when you enter into where you're supposed to be, don't forget me. That was asking in his own way to forgive him of what he was dying for. A change. The fact changed. Jesus isn't dead. That's a fact. He was dead. That's a fact. He was dead for about 24, 36 hours. But it's the fact is, is he's alive. He lives today. He lives today and beckons people today just like the thief. All you got to do is look at him and he'll beckon to you. Because he lives, you and I live. Because he lives in eternity, he says, you'll be with me in eternity is what the word says. Fact. Our faith was born on this day. Jesus is alive. Our faith, what we walk in, what we talk about, what we believe was born today. This is the birthplace of our faith. This is the birthplace of our grace. This is the birthplace of our mercy. This is the birthplace of everything that you and I believe in and stand for. This is it today. This experience is at the heart of our Christian message. Fact is today we have a mandate, you and I. Turn with me over to Luke chapter... Um, no, turn me over. I'm sorry. Turn, turn me over with me. Turn with me. Yeah, turn me over. <laughs> Turn with me. That's why I listen to myself sometimes because I realize I say things like, turn me over. It's like, it's like flip him. He's done on one side. Uh, Matthew chapter 28. We, we talked about the opening verses to this chapter and let's look at the very last one. 16 through 20. It says, And then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And they saw him and he worshipped and they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said, come, uh, Jesus, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus said, you have a mandate. That fact hasn't changed, won't change till he returns. That's a fact that can't be superseded by somebody eating or, or, or giving you another mandate. That one is commanding over all for the believer. It's the driven purpose for all of us. Uh, Rick, Rick, uh, remember, Rick Warren wrote a book, The Purpose Driven Church. The purpose that we're driven by is that those verses right there. I'm, I've never read the books. So I don't know what it says. But that, those verses right there is our driving force. That is our engine. That's our wheelhouse. That's what we're here. That's the mandate. That's the fact that Jesus gave us. Turn one more time back to our opening verse in Luke chapter 24. And then Rob's going to play a video. And then I'm going to come back up. We're going to pray. If you would like prayer today. Um, and... <laughs> Communion. We have communion. That's what I save it all the time for, I guess. Communion. Listen to this again. Verse, chapter 24 of Luke, verses 1 through 3. Do you can imagine how much time you're going to owe me next week? 
pack a lunch. I didn't expect this to go this fast, but it's a good day to do this. Because I wanted the emphasis to be on the fact that facts are real, but they change. They change because we change. It doesn't negate the fact of yesterday, today's fact, but it is a reason for us to take, stand up and take note that God made us to do certain things, and that's a fact. And he brought Jesus here to die. He was dead, but now he's alive. In Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 3 again says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came and a certain woman with them came to the tomb bringing, and bringing the, sac- the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And what happened, and it happened is that they were uh, greatly perplexed about this. And behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then they... Um, uh, were afraid and bowed their heads, the faces to the earth, and they said to them, "Why do you seek them living among the dead? We don't we don't serve a dead savior. We don't serve a dead God. We don't serve a God that's in a tomb like those that serve Buddha. We don't serve a God that's in a grave like those that serve Muhammad. We don't serve a God that's in 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 a grave like those that serve all the other gods out there. We serve a living Christ." We serve a living Savior. We serve a living God. Today we've been redeemed. On that day, over 2,000 years ago, all of heaven rejoiced. And today, all of heaven rejoices at the redemption of the living Savior. All of heaven rejoiced today with us. Fact is, is that one day we'll be in that throng of rejoicing on a resurrection Sunday should Jesus tarry before we, uh, in our lifetimes. And the one, and there'll be that day that we're standing there. There's some people that just recently have gone to be Billy Graham, who preached the word of God for 50 years or more, is rejoicing at the throne today on this Resurrection Sunday. A, path, a, a, a friend and mentor of mine from Bible, Bible College, Dr. Barb, Bob Kirka, died this week and stepped into eternity this week is standing at the throne of Christ today, rejoicing on this resurrection Sunday. They know the reality of that. We only see in part, they see in full, the word says. But we get that opportunity by giving our lives to Christ. The fact is, who you were yesterday doesn't mean who you are today. And the fact of who you are today doesn't mean who you'll be tomorrow. Because each day, the facts of your life change. Each day doesn't matter how many times you fall and skin your knee, how many times you stub your toe. It doesn't matter how many times you fail Christ today. Tomorrow, the facts change in your life.